Uh, I've been given the topic of ARDS phenotypes, and uh, it's really uh, challenging to speak after Boris and Nina's kind of double act. Uh, I'll try. Um, there is very little clinical cases or vignettes here. It'll be uh, primarily focused on what's published slash what's written out there. A uh, bit of acknowledgement to my fund, uh, funded by the NIHR Clinician Scientist Award, so whatever I say, I believe in. It's not necessarily what Department of Health's view is. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest with this talk. And the last is a plug for the intensive care medicine. I, uh, I'm a section editor there. It's got an impact factor of nearly 20. So if you're interested, come and chat to us or to other people in the ESICM on the attending. Right. So I think Boris and Ines start to talk about endotypes. I just want to introduce those two terms again, uh, phenotypes and endotypes. So phenotype is an observable characteristic. Um, that is primarily driven by the underlying genetic makeup, plus minus some influence on the environment and something around the illness or the disease that they come in with. Um, probably the endotype is a slightly uh, more refined phenotype in that there is a biological mechanism that underpins the changes that you see. So the IL-5 antagonist treatment for a particular phenotype that Nina and Boris highlighted essentially probably meets loosely the definition of the endotype that we're talking about. So there is a subtle difference between a phenotype and an endotype, and the phenotype has been around for a long time, and the endotypes are starting to kind of uh, take shape. I think we kind of uh, have to give a lot of credit to the asthma literature, and probably some oncology literature. But I focus on asthma purely because of respiratory symposium. This is a, a fantastic review by Sally Wenzel, who originally published the uh, asthma endotypes uh, in Blue Journal in probably early 2011, where she essentially took uh, the bronchial lavage samples and highlighted there are broadly two different types of asthma phenotypes, at least at a molecular level. There is a TH2-dependent uh, phenotype where there is significant eosinophilia, IL-5, inflammation, and there's a T helper 2 phenomenon because of the cytokine secretion secondary to that. Then there is a non-TH2 asthma phenotype. And if you try and figure out what are the other underpinnings of these broad uh, endotypes that are TH2 and TH, non-TH2, you start to get a better treatment to intervention effect. So if you take this kind of simple argument forward, that's a figure again from the uh, Sally Wenzel paper, absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, right up. So you've got asthma, there is a broadly a childhood asthma and adult asthma, and within the childhood asthma, there is TH2 uh, dependent, and most of the adult asthma is likely to be non TH2 dependent, and then there are phenotypes within it, um, like an uh, aspirin uh, exaggerated respiratory disease, as an example. So there are things that you could use to start, harm, you know, harness or focus the therapy. And I think here is where the phenotype endotype discussion needs to kind of uh, start again. So if you think about a phenotype, phenotype is what we see at the end of the bed. It is observable clinical and some biological characteristics, you know, somebody with a bad lung, a bit of CRP, and a white heart and a CT, that is a phenotype. And you could say that within that broad ARDS phenotype, there are buckets or subgroups of patients who may respond differently to interventions because they've got different biology, fundamentally different biological mechanism that makes them kind of respond differently to treatment. Not every ARDS responds to steroids. Not every ARDS would respond to lutexamib as an example. And then another term that often uh, comes up in this context is enrichment. And I think enrichment is a very uh, kind of crude term where you start to say, OK, I can enrich somebody or a population of patients based on their risk of something. So a prognostic enrichment is somebody on their risk of dying or any other bad outcome. And I think in critical care, we've been doing this for a long time. Apache 2 score is a very kind of simple example of prognostic enrichment. I'll come back to prognostic enrichment with Berlin ARDS definition there and some of the trials. And then there is this um, other thing, which is slightly more tricky. Uh, rather hard in the context of ARDS is to kind of talk about predictive enrichment. I think predictive enrichment essentially highlights a scenario where you know before giving the treatment that you're going to give, there is likely to be a greater treatment response. The classic easiest example to digest is probably um, HLA-DR expression and GMCSF. If you give 
if you, there are a bunch of sepsis patients who have low HLA-DR expression, if you give them GM-CSF, they are likely to increase their HLA-DR. So in terms of response to therapy, that's an example where the surrogate outcome, which is HLA-DR, increases with the treatment that you give. Whereas in the broad picture, like an ARDS or a sepsis patient, this is hard to kind of predict before randomization. We can do a lot of post hoc things saying, oh, well, we gave some steroids, their, um, you know, their, their lung inflammation melted away, fabulous. But before giving, there is no way that we can for certainly say that that patient is responding to this treatment. So to kind of make this phenotype, endotype argument, the final slide, I think there is phenotypes uh, within endotypes and endotypes within phenotypes. And I think um, you can enrich them on either prognosis or predict predictive um, enrichment where you're, like, you're enriching them on their likely response to uh, therapy. So let's kind of get with that sort of intro, let's get into the ARDS uh, discussion. So we've been phenotyping ARDS for a long time. I think 1967 is the first uh, description, right, from Aspo Petty. I think when you look at them, uh, I was kind of fascinated by the history. This was um, Tom Petty's uh, kind of review or a summary in Blue Journal on the 25th anniversary of ARDS. Um, so the paper originally got uh, sent to New England Journal. Um, New England Journal uh, review comments were actually, peep is bad for you, don't, this is complete rubbish. And then it went to uh, JAMA uh, and um, the annals of thoracic surgery got rejected and then uh, essentially ended up in Lancet and with one small comment from Lancet saying, why don't you change it from adult to acute respiratory distress syndrome? Um, and then that's, and I think Tom Petty kind of ends by saying that's how it all began. So we've been doing this phenotyping for a long time. It's not anything new. It's just how could we refine it? And I think over time, we have refined the phenotype. The AECC definition was a refinement of the original ARDS phenotype. And actually, the subsequent Berlin definition is, again, a further refinement of the phenotype. So things that Berlin addressed that was not there in the AECC definition is the uh, time frame. Uh, so Luigi was a co-author in this paper. So I'm talking about something that Luigi knows better than me. Um, and then there is, uh, in the um, ALI categories, uh, there was um, a kind of slight degree of confusion between what does ALI mean and what does ARDS mean. And it's kind of changed over to mutually exclusive groups. I'll come back to that of ARDS. And that's where the predictive validity analysis uh, kind of was used. And they kind of sub, uh, ensured that there needs to be a minimum PEEP. Uh, the chest radiograph has always been a problem with ARDS. Um, no two clinicians would kind of agree on the chest radiograph, but I think they created some example radiographs to figure this one out. And the uh, cardiovascular and risk factor um, kind of differences between AACs and Berlin are well known. When you take Berlin uh, ARDS definition, they did a bunch of analysis that came with the definition. So the they categorized the patients based on the oxygenation into mild, moderate, and severe ARDS, the severe being P by F ratio less than 100. And you can see that the prevalence of um, mild and um, severe ARDS are much lower than the moderate ARDS population. And around 10% of mild ARDS can deteriorate to moderate, around 20% of moderate can deteriorate onto severe ARDS. What is probably the key thing about prognostic enrichment or a different phenotype is the predictive validity analysis. If you think about it, uh, mild has a mortality of somewhere between 27%, uh, moderate has a mortality of around 32%, and severe has a mortality of around 40%. This increase in mortality, or an incremental increase in mortality, generates a mutually exclusive category of ARDS, and that could be interpreted, in other words, as prognostic enrichment. If you pick uh, these patients with severe ARDS, they've got a higher risk of outcome. That's bad prognostic, prognosis or prognostic enrichment. So we know that we have refined ARDS over time. And I think the question uh, probably Luigi really wants me to talk about was, why should we and how could we refine this Berlin ARDS phenotype even more? And actually, does it matter? Uh, I mean, that's an important kind of uh, question to answer. And I think here the we need a better ARDS phenotype is an argument we can make uh, for enrichment and reducing the heterogeneity in the illness. Even within the severe ARDS, there is heterogeneous illness. So to improve uh, or enrich trial population with greater risk of bad outcome, you don't need anything more than Berlin definition. And I think 
a version of Berlin definition would suffice. And as you heard from uh, David this morning about the Eolia trial, uh, which is uh, ECMO for severe ARDS, um, and I won't kind of bore you with uh, the details of the stats analysis. Uh, that's the primary outcome. ECMO um, is uh, still better than uh, the control group, uh, even though p-values um, aren't relevant here because the trial was stopped early. The reason for stopping the trial was because if you were to continue the trial, you wouldn't get a p-value less than 0.05, or the treatment effect that they wanted to observe would not be observed if you were to continue for another 70 odd patients. That's the reason for stopping the trial. It's not ECMO doesn't work, so just to highlight that point again. All right, so an example of uh, predict uh, enrichment again here is the uh, prone position paper from the French group. The, um, the inclusion criteria here is the key, key to prognostic enrichment. Their, their P by F uh, ratio was much lower than what you would call ALI in the other studies that came out um, around prone. And when you do that, the event rate is higher and you probably start to see a treatment difference. The other way of uh, thinking about enrichment is the predictive enrichment argument or a respond affine type. So this is a lovely uh, reanalysis. Um, for, for those who don't know, Brian uh, Kavner is a fantastic uh, scientist in Toronto. Um, and he passed away a few days ago. Um, amazing contribution to the ARDS literature and hats off to him and um, we all miss him. All right. So this is a, a lovely bit of reanalysis of the um, loss in the express trials. What the authors are trying to do here is a fairly simple question. If I know somebody might respond to PEEP by changing their oxygenation, would I be able to identify a subpopulation for a future trial? They are not saying, this, this is one of the most misinterpreted papers in, in conferences, they're not saying that increase in PEEP improves outcome. They're not saying that higher PEEP actually is better in any shape or form. All they're saying is if they respond to PEEP with oxygenation, that's what this graph shows, change in uh, PF ratio following PEEP modification, and they are just a probability that as your PF increases uh, with increase in PEEP, um, they are just a probability of death drops down. This is hypothesis generating, and that actually will inform some of the future trials that may uh, go along this uh, you can make a similar argument for CO2 with uh, some of the interventions as well. For example, there are people talked about prone positions and CO2 clearance uh, in the context of ARDS. So this sort of argument can be made, and reanalysis is uh, very smart uh, to think through this. The last reason why we need to kind of probably think a bit more about ARDS heterogeneity uh, is the biology. And I think fundamentally, uh, ARDS biology is rather complex. Uh, you can make a reasonable argument that the most common cause of ARDS is likely to be uh, infection of some description, whether it's primary chest infection or somewhere else. Um, and then the, quite a lot of the uh, abnormalities that you see in the innate immune system are very similar to all critical illness, whether it be sepsis or ARDS or burns or whatever. Uh, that's been eloquently uh, presented by a number of studies, including the probably the first one that explicitly showed that was the um, paper in JX Med from the Blue Ground Group, where they took patients with trauma and they did, did a transcriptomics and they essentially showed that the innate and adaptive immune system is acutely altered even in trauma and then they subsequently had validation cohort on sepsis and ARDS. So the biology overlaps between trauma, ARDS and sepsis. So ARDS is, yes, slightly different, but there are so many similarities between the three syndromes that actually you can use common uh, biomarkers for these. And that's what you see when you look at the biomarker literature. So that's ARDS lung on the right. Um, it's a lovely bit of review from Taylor Thompson. Uh, every four years, they seem to kind of invite Taylor uh, to give an ARDS review in New England. Um, so here, on the right-hand side, uh, exudative face of the lung uh, filled up with uh, the non-surfactant fluid of whatever nature, quite protein-rich edema fluid. Surfactants is gone, endothelium is abnormal, uh, the innate immune systems are activated, there is uh, antigen presentation with an activated macrophage to the T cell, and the whole thing is uh, the immune system is on overdrive uh, right from the word go. Um, the, as soon as they come in, they, you see them with a ARDS phenotype. So you could finesse some of this biology to figure out if there are true endotypes of ARDS for future treatment. So what what could be, what, why is kind of uh, thinking about heterogeneity slightly tricky? So an example would be 
you're not going to see biology at the end of the bedside. You're going to see populations at the end of the bedside, patients at the end of the bedside, and quite a lot of trials will pick patients. Let's take a hypothetical example. This is a proportion of subjects on the uh, y-axis and uh, net treatment benefit on the x-axis. So this is the kind of uh, true population distribution, and this is trial one, trial two, and trial three. You can see that if you were to see some treatment benefit in one of the trials, but not in any other trial, you could argue that actually probably the trial had a bucket of patients that were very different unless you explicitly had an eligibility criteria that was different. Most of the ARDS trials, the eligibility criteria is the same. The exclusion criteria may be subtly different depending upon the intervention. You don't want somebody with a coagulopathy if you're going to give some heparin, as an example. So overall, uh, the, the population heterogeneity is the uh, variation in the susceptibility to either the illness, susceptibility to illness being death, or uh, to the treatment, uh, which is um, the intervention that you're going to get. When you focus on treatment, uh, there is something called as treatment effect heterogeneity, subtly different here. The argument is you got a trial population, and within that trial population, there is a non-random variation in the treatment, as in the, the trial population has got different baseline risk of death, and some of those patients with higher versus lower risk of death might vary differently to treatment. And this, we recently published this in, here we used the HARP2 trial. Um, what, what we saw in HARP2 trial is their baseline risk of death in HARP2 trial patients varied somewhere between two and a half to sevenfold. As in, if you were to quartile the HARP2 trial population, the risk of dying varied six to sevenfold, which is an important uh, point to make. And, Contrary to what we thought, uh, patients with lower risk of death within the HARP2 trial have probably a better treatment effect with uh, statins. Again, I'm not saying that that explains HARP2 trial. I'm just saying that there are, even within the trial populations, there are difficulties and unexpected results. And it kind of generates hypothesis for future work. OK. Right, everybody happy with the heterogeneity argument. I hope. All right, let's uh, think about the second part of the question, which is how could we derive uh, better ARDS phenotypes? And I think um, there are broadly six papers. Um, actually, the seventh one came, la came out last week, which I haven't included, but six papers. Uh, five, five randomized controlled trial reanalysis and one observational cohort from the MAS consortium. Um, all five randomized controlled trials were reanalyzed using what is called as a latent class analysis, and all five of them used both clinical and biomarker data. And the biomarker data include uh, some of the data from the lung epithelial damage, like a surfactant uh, protein, an S rate, some endothelial markers like angiopoietin 2, ICAM, and one Willebrand factor, some coagulation markers like a platelet activation plasmion activator inhibitor, protein C, some inflammatory markers such as IL-6, IL-8, soluble TNF receptor and CRP, and white cell. Um, the observational cohort study is a primarily a sepsis cohort um, from the MAS database in Netherlands. And they used primarily biomarkers and used a clustering algorithm as opposed to a latent class. In, a, in latent class analysis, all you're saying is the observed differences that you see in front of you is explained by an un, unseen class or variable. And that unseen class or variable is the variable that identify groups of patients. That's what latent class is. Cluster analysis is a very uh, simple algorithm where you're saying to the software, find me patients that look similar on these biomarkers. OK, that's sim in very simple terms, cluster analysis. So subtly different, uh, but more or less the same argument. All right, let's think about the uh, cohort, the, the RCT reanalysis. Most of the work has been led by Carolyn Calfi, um, absolutely brilliant scientist. So this is a landmark paper. This came out in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Uh, this is reanalysis of uh, the ARMA and uh, alveoli trials. You'll start to see similar figures. So they use latent class analysis. What they did was uh, to group patients based on their biomarker profile. So on X, axis is the biomarkers that they measured or the variables that they put into the model. So IL-6, IL-8, soluble TNF receptor, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are two phenotypes that are categorized based on how the standardized value differs between them. So if you, if you think about uh, the differences, the extremes will be where the differences are, right? 
So the red line is one phenotype, the blue line is the other phenotype. And if you were, if you are a betting man, you would say somewhere along these markers, somewhere along these would be different between the two phenotypes. And that's what they showed using the alveoli and the um, armor cohorts. And I think the, the probably the more interesting uh, bit of the uh, outcome which actually makes the paper um, interesting is this difference. So if you think about the two phenotypes, uh, phenotype one and phenotype two, the phenotype two is the hyperinflammatory phenotype. If I were to go back one figure, you can see uh, the phenotype two here has got quite a lot of IL-6, IL-8, insoluble TNF receptor, metabolic acidosis, and low levels of protein C and low blood pressure. So that's the kind of hyperinflammatory <coughs> phenotype. The hyperinflammatory uh, phenotype um, responded differently to PEEP uh, compared to the um, phenotype one or the non-inflammatory phenotype. And actually, the second thing to uh, point out is the distribution. Hyperinflammatory phenotype is around a third. So this is simple ARDS, uh, not Boris and Nina stuff. This is just Berlin or AECC ARDS. And even within that, only a third of them have got this hyperinflammatory uh, phenotype description. Uh, and those are the kind of outcome differences. So the mortality, the hyperinflammatory phenotype at 90 days is around 50%. Keep that number in mind because I'm going to kind of come back to that number along the rest of the slides. So that's the uh, first paper. Then they went on to do very similar analysis with very similar biomarkers uh, in the FACT trial. And what you start to see is the consistency in phenotype. The hyperinflammatory phenotype, again, has got 6 and 8, uh, high soluble TNF receptor, high, uh, low bicarbonate, low protein C, and low systolic blood pressure. And uh, the distribution, again, hyperinflammatory phenotype is around a third of the overall uh, phenotype. This is FACT trial, which is uh, fluid resuscitation. Um, and I think the second point here is the you can see uh, the subphenotype 2 uh, has got a higher mortality of around uh, 50%, and, um, and it responds differently uh, to treatment with fluids. The next study that they, again, Carolyn Calfee's group here, it's a sales study, which is the statins in ARDS. Um, so, uh, similar sort of picture, um, you can see IL-6, IL-8, uh, soluble TNF uh, receptor uh, being high in the hyperinflammatory group and bicarbonate protein C, systolic blood pressure and platelets being uh, low in the hyperinflammatory phenotype. So the, there wasn't any outcome difference in this analysis. And I think the point here uh, you start to see is three randomized controlled trial cohorts reanalysis start to show consistent phenotype with more or less similar, similar-ish looking biomarkers that identify or discriminate the uh, two phenotypes. So one of the questions here uh, at this point was to say, okay, uh, these are all US-based studies. These are all AECC definitions. These trials had similar set of biomarkers. What if we measure slightly different biomarkers uh, and identify a randomized controlled trial from a different setting? Would we see similar sort of pattern? And that's what we did uh, with the HARP2 uh, trial um, reanalysis, which is published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. So what we did was to reduce the number of biomarkers we measured. So we had soluble TNF receptor 1, IL-6, and creatinine, uh, and, the, and platelets. So those were the kind of discriminant biomarkers in the HARP2 reanalysis. The important thing, again, to point out is the hyperinflammatory phenotype is around a third of the study population. If you were to take a trial population, hyperinflammatory is a third. I think this has got uh, treatment implications or trial design implications as well. If you take a, if you decide to do a randomized controlled trial of a hyperinflammatory phenotype, uh, because your outcome is different, they might respond differently to treatment, which are anti-inflammatory. The first problem you have to overcome is uh, the time required to randomize these patients, because they are only a third of the RDS population, and then. Um, by the time you apply exclusion criteria, you apply patients not willing to randomize, uh, patients missed for, missed for randomization, lack of consent, etc. Your trial design is going, to, your trial might take a long time. And I think the second point is all of these are post hoc analysis. Most of them are unplanned post hoc, and therefore there is a there might be a spurious effect that we are seeing. 
uh, as a, if you're a pure statistician, you would say, well, you've cut the population into two. One of the populations has got a greater risk of dying, and therefore anything that you see in that population might be fundamentally different purely from a chance point of view than anything else. So as none of these analyses are powered for the uh, subsets that you're seeing. And in the, in the HARP2 trial, we, we saw a difference in the uh, mortality and in the ventilator-free day dif outcomes at 28 days and 90 days. So this is the MARS cohort. This is an observational uh, cohort uh, study, which more or less is a sepsis cohort study. And then they uh, took uh, biomarkers um, that were available to them, um, which is IL-13, TNF-alpha, GMCSF, uh, interleukin 1, beta 6, 8. Um, this is an interesting one, matrix metalloprotein C, because ARDS biology, um, there is neutrophil activation, and the matrix metalloprotein activity is much higher. And that's an important uh, thing to make, especially in the context of raised IL-8. Uh, and um, sadly for Nina, there isn't any IL-5 that they measured. Otherwise, you know, we, could have, we could have talked about it. And there's quite a lot of antithrombin 3, EPA1, and uh, tissue plasminogen activator. So here, what they saw was a two phenotype model. Uh, the, the green bits are the two clusters when you do a cluster analysis. And there is a hyperinflammatory cluster at the top where uh, the levels of quite a lot of the inflammatory phenotypes are much higher. Like, for example, IL-8, you can see it's red. Um, and that's uh, comparatively low for uh, the bottom phenotype. So uh, you've got two phenotypes, a hyperinflammatory phenotype and what they called as a reactive phenotype. Uh, because they couldn't use the term hyperinflammatory because somebody else used it for something else. Uh, sorry, Boris. Uh, and then the uh, this is a non-reactive phenotype. And again, I think uh, this is an important point. Um, they had a training cohort and a validation cohort. And you see that the first point to make is the uninflamed versus the reactive. The reactive phenotype is a greater risk of dying. And the original odds uh, sorry, a Berlin definition, mild, moderate, severe, predictive validity still holds true. And I think so within the, even within the biological phenotypes, if you're hypoxic, that hypoxia is still uh, a valid predictor of outcome. And I think uh, that is an important point to kind of keep in mind when we start thinking about um, sub-phenotypes using biology. Uh, at this point, there's a question that existed in the literature, which was actually OK, we've used pre-randomization variables to identify these phenotypes. What if we look at a variable beyond into the, tri into the trial? Will, are these ARDS phenotypes stable? Because if you think about trial design, you may not be able to get every patient who comes in on day one into a trial. So how long is it stable for? And that's what uh, Carolyn did uh, with this analysis of the FAT trial, sorry, the ARMA trial and the Albuli trial. What they showed essentially is that up to day three, uh, the original phenotype that we attributed to the population still holds true. So uh, here, day zero uh, and day three, the class one uh, on day zero is still class one on day three and in the armor trial. And similarly, 95% of class one is still class one. And uh, class two, 89% uh, is still class two. There is some degree of swap over, but they are relatively stable phenotypes. Um, so that's a kind of the uh, six or seven studies that uh, did the phenotype model. So if you don't want to kind of go through all of those papers, we've written a, a reasonably uh, comprehensive review. You can, you can read it. Um, so I'll leave you with uh, that sort of uh, summary. I think ARDS is a heterogeneous illness. You can identify sub-phenotypes. There is a hyperinflammatory sub-phenotype or a reactive sub-phenotype and a non-inflammatory phenotype. The reactive phenotype has got a greater risk of death, um, roughly around 50%. And, the, and that's kind of very similar to the reactive phenotype in the observational cohort. And there are some discriminant markers that are consistent across the trials, which is IL-6, soluble TNF receptor, bicarbonate platelets. And in the, in the uh, cohort study, IL-6, interferon gamma, ANG1 and 2 ratio, and PA1 are, are the discriminant markers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, man, of this great overview. I think it goes back uh, to what we started with this morning, say how important it is to find the right phenotype to address the right treatment for, 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 for this syndrome. So 
any questions to start with? Okay, while you are thinking, I, I oh, there is one, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much, great overview. Uh, do you think uh, that, um, how is can be this uh, a real practical approach so from the point of view of the laboratory, the hospital organization, at least in, in your experience, the cost, uh, so how far we are from a possible uh, uh, practical application, at least from clinical point of view at the bedside? Yeah, C can I have the last slide back up again, please? So uh, we recently have got funding to prospectively validate this uh, kind of using these discriminant markers as a point of care test um, across the UK. Uh, so we are probably two to three years away from completing that uh, study. So that will be uh, one of the studies. And I think the Canadians are thinking about doing a similar sort of observational cohort study uh, to address this question. I think that's an important question. Can we actually prospectively identify them at the bedside? Absolutely. I think uh, that We'll also, we're also doing some uh, modeling around how long will it take if you were to do this to include in a trial. So that, again, it's, it's called as a fine study. Danny McCauley from Belfast is the chief investigator for the study, and we are just starting to roll out. And the beauty of that is that we are going to have point of care device in ICU uh, for measuring a selection of these markers. Uh, um, so the technology for IL-6 soluble TNF receptor, IL-8, etc., is fairly simple. It's an ELISA, and we can do it and with high sensitivity ELISA. Yeah. Told us uh, is the time, mm -hmm. so that they have uh, these kits uh, for I don't know 20, 25, whatever, uh, and so in order uh, you know, not to waste uh, the kits that they have a certain cost, uh, th they can do, but it takes some time. Time, yeah. So, do you think, or at least in your experience, there is some uh, improvement in this technology? I mean, to have a point of care uh, like. Pro more or less like procalcitonin, I yeah, can yeah. say. So for us, is like the Ra uh, Randox is the company that are developing the point of care kit for this fine study, and they, s they seem to think that they can give an output in four hours. Um, and they, they have done a validation between uh, point of care versus standard ELISA, and they seem to think that there is a, a high correlation between the two measurements. And both all, all these measurements are high sensitivity, so very similar to high sensitivity troponin. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Danny McCauley is the person to speak to you because he's the chief investigator. <laughs> Any questions? Any further question? Well, what do you think about it? Manu, I was um, um, obviously looking at the, amount, the number of variables and biomarkers and also reflecting that the initial distinctions you've made between phenotype and endotype is a bit blurred into this um, yep. CALFI phenotype. But what do you think is the minimum number of variables? Because I've heard recently, uh, Michael Mata, it's actually they're validating three or four. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering, in your experience, what's the minimum number that will make it valid, uh, the distinction between the phenotypes still being stable? Yeah, so uh, basic rock curve math, the more the number of variables, better the rock curve. Yeah. So that's a starting point. And I think four biomarker model, uh, gives a rough rock area of around 0.85 to 0.93. That's a kind of, and I think the 0.85 is when you start using uh, stuff like interferon gamma, where the likelihood of interferon gamma being low in the context of an acute illness means that the discriminant value becomes difficult to me, whereas a higher biomarker is easy to discriminate. Thank you. Uh, there's nothing, there's nothing very interesting here. Uh, some, some comments from you. Apart from the, the um, biological markers, no? that of course yeah. this is uh, what we discussed, more or less, uh, uh, the more severe are those patients with uh, uh, vasopressors uh, yeah. and bicarbonate, so I suspect also a bit more uh, metabolic acid, so with some hemodynamic problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, let us say my general view. However, it's interesting that in the sub-analysis of uh, post-hoc analysis of the ART trial that we yes. discussed this morning, those pa I mean, you would expect uh, in these patients a uh, uh, better effect, for example, of PEEP. I'm just, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, interestingly, when they look at the 
possible negative association in the heart. They found pneumonia and the use of hazardous drugs. So very intriguing <laughs> because... Uh, so, so I think the, um, when, you, when, when you have somebody with vasopressor therapy, their, pro, their risk of outcome is worse than compared to those who don't. And I think, to me, if the primary intervention doesn't have a direct, is not in the direct causal pathway, you would probably expect that effect to be retained uh, in the analysis. I think that's what is happening in the art reanalysis that uh, Fernando did, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Very good. Any other questions? Bana, I was going to pick up on your point. You said essentially that roughly one third is, is hyperreactive, um, and um, therefore you'll take more time to achieve your sample size. But do you think because the effect size might be bigger or magnified, yeah. uh, actually that problem may be less relevant than we anticipate? Mm. So uh, the mortality is around 50%. Yeah. Um, if you were to do a 10% absolute risk reduction, that gives you a relative risk of 20%. You need roughly 800 patients. And that is still, uh, still a challenge. Still a challenge. Yeah. Um, so I think the uh, probably the best example is Anand's uh, adrenal trial, mm -hmm. so adren a corticosteroid trial, where he had the factorial design initially with APC, and then there were so many challenges in the whole trial, but essentially issue was recruitment into that bigger trial, uh, despite all of this. I think it, it still is an issue. The risk of dying um, in any trial is concentrated on the highest risk population. So mm -hmm. even if you overall trial may have 50% risk of dying, but the highest risk population would still be slightly low where the maximum events will come from. So. Very interesting. Any? Oh, Nina. My understanding is with respect to the biological actions of IL-6 that, that they are numerous and not purely binary. Um, so it's not such a, an on-off situation, um, and it has a number of pro-inflammatory in addition to obviously important housekeeping roles. Is there any sense um, of the dominance of or the balance of those actions in these patients or in these cohorts? Because of course there is a there, yeah. there is a widely available IL-6 blocker on the market that, yeah. that is not without risk, and there are safety signals around their use. So I wonder what your thoughts were on that. So there are log order differences between IL-6 between patients. The IL-6 to IL-10 uh, ratio is not consistent between cohorts. I think that's the issue. So people haven't figured out whether the pure IL-6 blocking would actually be of any value because if, the va if, the, if there are log order differences between patients and you take a binary cutoff artificially, the corresponding IL-10 may not be as, the association may not be as clear as before. Mm. 